Today, I am pulling back the curtain and I am taking you behind the scenes to share my five phase process with you that I go through in order to prepare for a new watercolor pencil landscape. This five phase process really helps me flow through the creation of that final piece a lot more smoothly with a lot more enjoyment and it also helps me arrive at much better results. This is a long video because I wanted to be thorough and I didn't want to hold anything back. And honestly, I really feel that this kind of information is lacking in videos nowadays and tutorials that are shared online. And because artists who are sharing resources online and videos and whatnot have to play to the algorithm so that their videos are shown to people, they have to keep their content super short and super digestible. And this oftentimes, especially when it comes to art, can be harmful. I have had so many conversations with beginners and even more advanced artists who let me know about their frustration and their confusion because these super short videos lead them to think that people create amazing art incredibly fast and that they create that amazing art on the first try without having done any practice or prep work beforehand. And this is not the case at all. So not only did I want to create this video for those of you getting started with watercolor pencils and looking to level up your artwork, but I also wanted to create this video for those of you who are looking to simplify your creative process and not feel like you are stumbling through the creation of your artwork and you want to arrive at better results more consistently. All right, so with all that said, let's go ahead and jump into phase one. All right, everyone, so step one is going to be to do our brainstorming. So we already know that we're gonna be working on a landscape or a nature scene, but is it going to be a summer-inspired scene, a fall-inspired scene? And is it going to be a seascape? Is it going to be like a forest area or a park area? What are we feeling called to paint right now? And we don't have to be super specific or super concrete with everything that we're going to be bringing in. That is a little bit later. For my brainstorming, I'm going to be using this small old sketchbook and this is a drawing pencil. And I'm going to be just showing you my way of brainstorming. I like doing a little web and how large your web ends up being is really going to depend on how concrete or specific your idea is right off the bat because if you start with a very specific idea that you wanna work on, then you don't need to do too much brainstorming. But this is what I like doing. So for example, if I already know that I wanna do a landscape, I start with landscape at the top, but then maybe I have a couple of different landscapes that maybe I wanna work on at some point soon. And one of them is a summer landscape, and one of them is a fall landscape, because fall is coming up soon. And then I start specifying things a little bit more. So what can I find in a summer scene that perhaps I wanna work on? And what can I find in a fall scene that perhaps I may wanna work on? For the summer scene, maybe I have a beach scene and maybe I have a river scene and maybe I have a farm scene that perhaps would be interesting to work on. These three are my ideas for the summer scene. For the fall idea, maybe I have a park scene where I have a bench and there are beautiful fall colored leaves on the ground, that kind of thing. And maybe I have a forest scene with lots of dry trees and fall leaves on the ground. And maybe the last one is like a, a winding path out in nature, something like that. So those are my three ideas for the fall scene. And in the next step, I'm going to specify things even more. And what I mean by this is, I am now going to start thinking of the specific ideas, elements, things that I want to bring into each one of these scenes. Just as an example, the beach scene, I'm gonna need an ocean, sand, maybe an umbrella or two, maybe figures walking on the beach, and maybe I even imagine warm colors for my sunset. And I can start thinking of colors already at this point. So those are all specific ideas I'm already kind of drawn to when it comes to ocean scenes that I may want to incorporate into my painting. I'll give you another example. When it comes to the farm scene, well, maybe I want a red barn. And I already know since the beginning that I want my barn to be red. If you don't necessarily want your barn to be red, 
you can just leave that color out and just say barn. And then maybe I want some horses. And maybe I want a wooden fence with crooked posts, kind of a rustic fence. And I definitely want some trees. Over here in the beach one, you could also write something like palm trees. Whereas over here, these trees would be different. Now, when it comes to the river scene, what do I want in my river scene? I want a winding river shape. I want flowers. Maybe I haven't decided specifically what colors I want my flowers to be, but I do want to make sure to make them colorful and bright. And then I want trees in my river scene. And maybe I also want a little house or cottage. And just to give you another example of one of the fall scenes over here, maybe you want to do a park scene, right? And maybe in the park you want to include a bench, lots of leaves on the ground and you want your leaves to be warm colors, the ones on the ground and the ones on the trees. And maybe you imagine these trees in the park to be creating like interesting shadows on the ground so that you can have a nice contrast with light areas and dark areas. As you can see, I went from something very general a landscape or a nature scene, I started getting more and more specific about the elements that I might want to possibly bring into my piece. And the point of doing this is for you to actually start visualizing the scene in your head, in your mind's eye, and start thinking of the specific ideas that you might want to bring in, and you start eliminating things that you don't want. It's easier to plan. So it's just a great way to start going from general toward specific really narrowing things down and starting to visualize what you want for your final piece. You can start getting excited about what you want to work on. This said, we haven't really gotten super, super specific. That's what we're going to be doing in the next steps. So I'm going to be doing a summer inspired scene and it's going to be a river scene. And maybe you already know, for example, that you want to do a beach scene. In that case, you would start with beach scene over here at the top. You wouldn't start as general as I did right here. You would start with beach scene and then you would divide things into different types of beach scenes. For example, maybe you could have a beach scene that's more like a cloudscape where the focal point and the action is up in the sky and the ground is very simple. And another one is going to be more like figures um, standing and maybe enjoying some relaxing time. And maybe the next one is going to be a boat scene. And those are the ones that you would take further to individual elements that you want to maybe bring into each scene. After doing my brainstorming, I move on to collecting references. Even though I'm going to be coming up with the scene from imagination and I'm not going to work with any specific photo, it's good to just observe photos. If you're here, you're probably a visual person like I am. This always helps inspire me and starts getting me into thinking about color. And sometimes it's through observing photos that I think of little ideas that can really enhance the final piece that I would have otherwise never thought of. And I just like taking around five to 10 minutes to collect just a few photos based around the elements that I've already decided that I'm gonna be bringing into this nature scene. So I take the specific words that I already have in my web that I did in phase one, and I enter these words into Google. I like using Google Images though, not the regular Google. If you've never gone into Google Images before, it's just a matter of going to google.com and then clicking on the Images button on the top right. A few examples that you could enter into the Google search tab in this case, for example, could be nature scene with river or winding river landscape or landscape with colorful flowers or nature scene with cottage, anything like that that brings in one or more of the elements that you've already decided that you're going to be bringing in you're not going to be using any specific reference photo from the ones that you find. 
what you're going to be doing is you're going to be taking what you need from each photo and mishmashing these elements together and you're going to be creating your own nature scene from imagination sometimes after i've collected my references i just observe these in the very beginning and then i set them aside and i don't actually use anything except my brain as i am moving forward and other times I'm actually observing these reference photos as I am working on my thumbnail sketches. It really depends. If, for example, you're thinking of bringing in a specific kind of tree and it's a kind of tree that you've never drawn or painted before, it really might be worth observing that reference photo that shows that specific kind of tree as you're moving forward. Something that is very important in order for you to not waste any time when it comes to looking for your reference photos is it's one thing to look for reference photos when you already have your specific ideas that you want to work with in mind and it's quite another thing to not have any idea of what to work on and just look for random reference images you need to have some sort of direction when you're looking for reference photos if you don't stem from any specific idea you can really go down a rabbit hole because you're going to have so many different ideas, so many things thrown at you, and you might end up not doing anything at all. This is why it's so important to go through phase one, the brainstorming process. And I would also say to give yourself a specific amount of time for your collection of references. It's very easy to go down a rabbit hole and end up wasting two hours of your time just looking at beautiful nature scene photos just to end up not doing anything at all. So avoid this by always making sure that you're looking for specific things. This is why going through that first phase is very important. I give myself 10 minutes max to collect my references and usually it's about five to six reference photos tops and I create a little folder that I keep on my computer desktop that I place all of these reference photos in. All right, moving into phase number three of my planning and preparation process. This is the phase where I finally start with my thumbnail sketches. For those of you who have never heard this term before, thumbnail sketches are quick, rough, usually small drawings or sketches that you create in preparation for a more finalized folder piece. You could also, of course, work on thumbnails just as studies in between larger projects, not necessarily in preparation for something but thumbnails are incredibly helpful and you can use them in a variety of different ways to help you plan for different things and make sure that your process that you go through as you're creating that more finalized piece goes more smoothly and that you arrive at better results thumbnails can be used for a variety of different things I personally use them to plan out my visual compositions so what elements am I going to be bringing in where are they going to be with in the picture plane what elements do I want to change if I am going with any specific reference photos where is the horizon line going to be that is super important in scenes and landscapes etc in other cases thumbnails are used to create value studies or tonal studies to make sure that there is a good balance between light values and dark values before moving on to the final piece and in other cases artists also use thumbnails to plan their different colors that they're going to be bringing in like I'm going to be sharing with you in just a bit. In this phase I'm going to be working in a larger sketchbook and as you can see I have already created four separate rectangles in one single page in my sketchbook and I've left some space between these in case I'd like to take some notes as I am moving forward. Make sure that these little squares rectangles have similar proportions to the final piece that you're planning on working on because because if you create squares or vertical rectangles for your thumbnails when you are planning your final composition to be more of a horizontal rectangle like the ones that I have here that is going to be an issue because you cannot really plan your composition very well if the format and the proportions are very very different always remember that your positive and negative spaces or active and inactive areas in your compositions doesn't matter what kind of 
of subject it is that you're drawing or painting, whether it's a landscape or a still life arrangement or a portrait, whatever the case may be, that balance between your positive and negative spaces or active and inactive areas is incredibly important. And you cannot plan for your positive and negative spaces if you're not working in a similar format to what your final piece is going to be. The more similar your format is or the proportions of your little drawing space are to that final piece that you're gonna be working on, the better you're gonna be able to plan things out. So now that I know all of the specific things that I want to bring into this summer-inspired river scene, I wanna play with the scale or size of these elements in space. I wanna play with their locations in space, which element is closer to us as the viewer of this scene, which element is farther away, etc. When you're planning your compositions, for scenes and landscapes, it's very important that you think of what elements are going to be closest to the viewer of the scene in the foreground, which elements are going to be kind of a midway distance away in the middle ground, and what elements are going to be furthest away. Because if you add very few elements, it's going to feel very flat. You're not going to be able to create that believable sensation of open space and depth if you have too few elements in your scene. So giving thought to foreground, middle ground, and background elements is always going to be super helpful. The first thing that I do is I add in my horizon line. This is one of the first things that you need to plan for. The horizon line is essentially your eye level as the viewer of the scene, and it goes hand in hand with perspective. And one thing I never ever do, except in some like rare cases, is create the horizon line right in the middle of my picture plane. There are exceptions where the artist was able to create a successful landscape or scene in which the horizon line is right in the middle, dividing the picture plane into equal top and bottom halves. In those cases, the artist still managed to make excellent use of perspective and there is a symmetry created in other ways and so the composition works at the end. But I wouldn't recommend breaking up the composition into equal halves, especially in the beginning and you're learning about the rule of thirds and vanishing points and vantage points and how to create asymmetrical compositions. I would just recommend keeping your horizon line somewhere that is not right in the middle. All right, so now that my horizon lines have been added in, I'm gonna go ahead and start drawing these different elements that I had thought of before. All of these are going to have a river, they're gonna have flowers, they're gonna have trees, and they're gonna have a little house or cottage. I'm just gonna be thinking of different ways that I can add these into the scene using my creativity, but also bringing to mind all of those quote unquote perspective rules so that I don't accidentally take away from the realism of the piece. As a rule of thumb, you wanna make sure that things that are closest to us as the viewer of the scene are larger and things that are farther away are smaller. These are all going to be flowers over here. Lots of little colorful flowers. Just doing a little bit of quick shading, quick value development, so that I can visualize things a little bit more. Little trees and shrubs behind the cottage. A little fence. I like the idea of bringing in a fence and the winding river. So here's thumbnail sketch number one. You can see how I have given thought to bringing in elements in the foreground, middle ground, and background so that I can have those layers that will help me create a lot of interest and depth in the final piece. I'm gonna move on to another arrangement 
and maybe in this one I'm going to be bringing in hills or mountains instead of this far away tree line. Maybe this one is going to have more like evergreen trees in the middle ground. And when I add trees, I always try to make sure that I'm adding them in odd numbers, not pairs or even numbers. This makes things more interesting, more irregular, less symmetrical and organized looking and patterny looking. And for this one, the river is going to be less curved, going like that. For this one, I have more space in the sky because the horizon line is lower so I could play more with clouds and maybe use like more interesting colors in the sky. Usually when it comes to landscapes and scenes you want to decide whether there is more stuff going on in the top above the horizon line or below the horizon line or on the ground. If it's a cloudscape and what's interesting about the composition is up in the sky and that's where you want to attract the viewer's attention toward, that's what the focal point is. You don't want too much going on on the ground because the viewer is not going to know where to look at. It's just too much. Whereas if the action and the focal point is on the ground, you can really bring up the horizon line, give more space to this area, and keep the sky nice and simple. I always want to give thought to that kind of thing. Maybe here we have two little houses. And we have the colorful flowers here in the foreground. So that is my little nature scene composition number two. I'm gonna move on to the third. I've already done the winding river coming from the right, so I'm gonna to try to do it coming from the left this time and see what I can do in terms of changing the arrangement of these elements in space. I'm gonna make sure to create a lot of irregularity want some trees to be taller, others to be shorter, some to be wider, distance them apart differently as well. Three evergreen trees, and maybe here I have a little hill in the back. And maybe in this one, the house. Make sure that the size of the house makes sense with this perspective. I don't want it to be too small or too large. And maybe this one has a little fence as well. Maybe the fence comes all the way. And maybe I have more trees here, and shrubs. And then in this one, I could have little flowers here and here, colorful flowers. So here we have some evergreen trees, little irregular area, and the winding river is coming from the left and going down. Have more irregularity in the faraway distance, maybe a tree line all the way back, little hill. And we have a fence in the foreground with crooked little posts. Add in some clouds, or interest and balance, flowers in the foreground. And I'm going to think of a last one. Same types of elements, different arrangement. So in this one, I have very little space for my sky. In this one, I'm going to have a huge tree very close to us in the foreground. And maybe the river is going to be closer to us here. Maybe the river is going to be down here in this one. I'm 
couple of little trees to the left and one to the right so that I can keep things in odd numbers in this area. Add some small hills over here above the horizon line. Some shrubs over here. And this one is going to be a little fence. And the flowers are going to be down here in all of the foreground. A little fence. A tree in the foreground. Large tree. The river. the little flowers so this is it for my four little thumbnail sketches I would recommend working on at least three different thumbnail sketches, really pushing yourself to come up with different arrangements because quite often our first idea is not the best. Anywhere from three to five, I would say, is a great place to start. Now what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be choosing one and I'm gonna be taking that one on to phase number four. All right, so in another page of my sketchbook, I created this horizontal rectangle similar to the format I was working in in my previous thumbnails. And what I'm gonna be doing in this larger rectangle is I'm just gonna be taking this thumbnail that I chose and I'm gonna be sketching that out a little bit larger and a little bit cleaner over here. In this one, I'm not gonna be doing any value or shading development. I'm gonna be bringing in those watercolor pencils and quickly filling in elements and spaces with those specific colors. So for now, I'm gonna place these sketches right over here off screen, and I'm just gonna be redoing that same sketch, only this time it's gonna be larger. So for this one, my horizon line is slightly above the middle of the picture plane. I have a hill in the background. I have a bit of a higher area here. You can work things out further if you need to in this larger sketch. I have a large evergreen tree. It's creating that irregular triangular shape very roughly. It doesn't reach the top of the picture plane. It stays within the picture plane. I have a slightly shorter evergreen that is actually in front of this one. And there's gonna be like a shorter one here. I wanna distance them out differently from each other. Really staying away from patterns. Those are my three evergreens right here. Plants and shrubs here at the bottom. Irregular lines, we're out in nature. And then the river is gonna come down so all of this is river. And then the little cottage is going to be here. Chimney, irregularity in front of the cottage. And I have another triangular tree and other types of trees back here, trees and plants. And then in this one, I had planned the fence. Fence is going to be right there, and it's gonna come around. And I'm gonna clean this up a little bit. I'll be adding the little flowers with the watercolor pencils. I'm gonna take my kneaded eraser and lighten my sketch a little. 
Okay, so we're now gonna be moving on to the main objective for this phase in the process, which is going to be choosing the specific colors that we're gonna be bringing into the final painting process. All right, so this is my gold Faber Aqua set from Faber Castell. It has 36 different colors in it. I am a huge believer in using a limited amount of colors and really giving thought to the colors that you're gonna be bringing in, how you're gonna be repeating them throughout the piece because that is going to lead to a greater color harmony and a sense of integration. And the main objective with this phase of the planning process is we want to pick the color scheme or specific colors that are going to allow us to create the variety of hues and values that we want all throughout our piece. If we want to create a believable sensation of open space and depth, nothing throughout our drawing or painting should be flat. In real life, everything around us has a variety of different values or tones throughout it. And another thing that I have in mind in this phase of the process is aerial perspective. Aerial perspective is something that I would highly recommend learning about if you're into drawing or painting landscapes and scenes. Aerial perspective tells us that things that are farther away are gonna be cooler in temperature, lighter in value, and less detailed, less defined, less textured. And things that are closer to us as the viewers of the scene are going to be warmer in color temperature, darker in value, and more detailed, more textured, more defined. So those are two things that I have in mind when I am choosing my colors. I wanna be able to create lighter areas, mid-tone areas, and darker areas all throughout the different elements or sections of my piece. And I wanna make sure that I'm bringing in aerial perspective to really push the things that are farthest away in the background and maybe the middle ground farther back and create that distinction between what is closer to the viewer of the scene and what is farthest away. I'm observing the reference photos that I collected to get ideas of the different colors that I might wanna bring in. And right now I am just removing the specific colors that I think might be good options for me from my set. These are not the final options. I'm gonna be swatching these out and making decisions in just a bit. Right now, I am just bringing out these colors so that I can test them out. In landscapes and nature scenes, greens are of course very important. So I'm gonna be bringing in a lighter green, a mid-tone green, and a darker green so that I'm able to create the variety of different green values that I want throughout the grass areas, throughout the leaves of these trees and the mountains, etc. Another thing that I'm gonna be bringing in are blues because I have a river and I wanna bring in at least a couple of different blues, a lighter blue and a darker blue. And I can repeat those blues in my sky. I also wanna bring in a couple of different browns because I want the little roof of that house to be brown and I also need browns for the tree trunks, for the little wooden fence, etc. Grays might be helpful for little rocks along the river or in other areas throughout the grass and also to create a hint of different values in the white walls of the cottage or the house. And I also wanna bring in a couple of different colors for my flowers. So how about maybe some pink and some orange? So here are a couple of different options for my pink and my orange. And then this is completely optional. This is something that I like doing whenever I'm gonna be working on a watercolor pencil piece. I like referring to these as wild card colors, colors that maybe wouldn't even be present in that scene, but I'm just choosing to bring in to add interest to the piece and to really push those darkest areas at the very end, which will help harmonize and integrate things together even further. I usually like bringing in blue or purple for my wildcard colors. In this case, I've already chosen a couple of different blues for my sky and my water, so I already have a blue right here. So I'm just gonna be bringing in a purple. So now I'm gonna be swatching out these different colors, and if I don't like one or two, then I can just go ahead and replace it with another one. First, I have my lighter green, I have my mid-tone green, and I have my darkest green. 
I think with these three colors, I'm gonna be able to develop a good range of values all throughout the green areas of the piece. So these will have me covered when it comes to all those areas. I will set them aside and then I'm gonna try out my blues that I'm gonna be using in the sky and the water. So I have my lighter blue and I have my darker blue. And I think these are good options for my blue areas. This is quite light and this is a lot darker, so that's going to allow for a good range of values in these areas. One thing that I might want to try out is overlapping my blue over my green or vice versa so that I can have some of that bluish green along the edges of my river, even have a little bit of a blue green in the river itself. So maybe take the mid-tone green, place some more on my paper here, and then you can take either the darker blue or the lighter blue, whichever two colors you're thinking of overlapping really, and doing a little bit of blending of the two, just to make sure that you like how those two colors blend together or merge together. I think it looks quite nice. All right, so now when it comes to the brown, I have my lighter brown and I have my darker brown. I think these two browns are gonna have me covered for the fence, for the little tree trunks, for the roof of the little house. This is a very light brown and this is quite darker, so it will allow for a good range of values. These two are definitely good options. Now when it comes to the flowers, I really don't need all four of these. I can pick a pink that I like best. I think I like this one a little bit more than this one, so I'm gonna set this aside and I'm gonna put this other pink back into my tin box. I don't need it. And then I'm gonna pick one of these two. This is more of a yellow orange and this is more like a red orange. So I think I like this one and this one for my flowers. So I'm gonna place these over here and I'm going to put that one back. Now I have a couple of different grays. I don't need these two. So I'm just gonna swatch these out, see which one I like best, and I'll put the other one back. Okay, so one is slightly warmer than the other, but in terms of value, they're pretty similar. I'm just gonna pick this one here for my rocks. I'm gonna place it over here. I'm gonna set this one aside in my tin box. And then my wild card color is gonna be this purple right here. I like it, it's like a secondary purple. So these are the colors that I'm going to be using. I have my three greens, I have my two blues, I have my colors for my flowers, my yellow, orange, and my pink. I have my two browns, my gray, and my wild card color. These are a total of 11 colors. I really don't need anything else. I'm gonna stick to using these and I'm not going to be bringing out colors out of whim from my watercolor pencil set. Now that I have chosen all of my colors, I'm gonna quickly fill in these areas that I am planning on using these colors in. I always start with my lightest color that I'm gonna be using for the area on hand and I move on to my darkest color. The blue is gonna be used in the sky. I'm gonna be taking my darker blue and doing a little bit of overlapping with this darker blue and releasing that pressure as I make my way up to create somewhat of a gradient. Try not to be overly perfectionistic. This is just a thumbnail. And then the little hill in the background, I can fill in with my medium green. I don't wanna use my darker green in this little hill because aerial perspective tells us that things that are farther away are going to be lighter. So I wanna keep the hills relatively light. Going in with my lightest green and filling in the grass areas and the leaves of the trees and shrubs. I'm just coloring over the fence because I'm gonna be just going over those fence lines and sections with my browns and the lighter green doesn't really affect the browns very much that I'm gonna be adding on top. I'm gonna be using a little bit of my medium green Color in a little bit of the trees. Letting that previous lighter green shine through in some sections here and there. And I can add a little bit of the medium green very roughly over some ground sections to create a little bit of irregularity and unevenness throughout the ground. 
going in with my darkest green and only using my darkest green in darkest shadow sections. I have a tutorial on painting different trees with watercolor pencils. I'll make sure to link to it down below in case you'd like to check it out. This tree is overlapping over these, so I'm just visualizing how shadows would be created in between the trees and also in between groupings of leaves in each tree, just very roughly. Some darker green sections on the ground. Shadow areas, little trees over here in the back, shrubs. I'm gonna fill in the water with my blues. So first I go in with my lighter blue, and I go in with my darker blue, and I only add in the darker blue in some darker areas along the river, allowing the previous lighter blue to shine through in other areas. I'm gonna bring in some of my medium green and add it, just pull it into some sections of that river here and there, merging these two colors together. Maybe I bring in some of my gray, Maybe some rocks and grass areas, but remember if you're going to be adding in rocks, larger rocks are closer to us, smaller rocks are farther away. I'm also going to be using this gray to create a little bit of a shadow effect on the white wall of the house right below the roof, where the roof is keeping that light from hitting that section of the wall. Then I'm going to leave everything else white. I'm going to fill in the windows and the door with gray. And now I'm gonna take my browns and I'm gonna make the roof of the cottage brown. The chimney as well. Maybe add in some hints of lines in the roof. I changed to my darker brown and I darkened some areas in the roof and the chimney with my darker brown. Create those lines again. And I'm gonna add a little bit of this darker brown in the windows and the door. Just fill those in roughly. And now I'm going to use these browns, first the lighter brown, then the darker brown, for the little fence. First I do the would-be horizontals for the fence. Look at all of this irregularity and imperfection that I'm creating. I am not going in with super stiff, straight, perfect lines. I actually want imperfection and irregularity. Now that my lighter brown lines have been done, I'm going to go over certain sections with my darker brown so that I can have a variety of brown tones or values in the fence and it's gonna make it look better than if I had only gone in with one same brown. These are my two colors that I picked for the flowers. I'm just gonna quickly go in with some scribbles Quick scribbling motions. Going in with my pink. Quick scribbling motions with my pink. Okay, so now all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna push those darkest value areas a little bit more by going in with my darker versions of my different colors. Now I'm pressing down a tiny bit more. And I'm gonna go in with my purple as well in just a bit. So think of shadow areas and just go into those deepest shadow areas. If you've never worked on tree studies, I would highly, highly recommend doing that. The fence is creating a little bit of a shadow shape on the ground. shrubs. Didn't color in the little tree trunks. Need some tree trunks over here. You can see how I'm just jumping around the entire drawing, pushing that contrast and expanding that range of values. Going in with my medium green, I'm going to start creating some little grasses. Don't want to go overboard with the detail, this is just a quick sketch. If there's anything that you want to work out, I would recommend doing it before moving forward. Don't guess 
and do things out of whim when you're working on the final one. You want to go in with a strategy and knowing what it is that you're going to be doing everywhere. Even when I go in with a strategy, sometimes it takes working on the piece two or three times before I really like the outcome. Adding a little bit of a darker value in the hills without going too dark. This hill is going to be a little bit closer to us than that hill over there. So I can make it a little bit darker than this one so that I can create that visual distinction between the two. If you want to work on transitions a little bit more or create different value areas, maybe things are looking a little bit too flat, you can always go back to your lighter colors. And finally, I'm going in with my wild card color, which is my purple. And I'm going to use it all over in all of these elements, in all these areas, but only in the darkest shadow sections. Everything that I am doing right here as I am moving along, filling all of these areas with color, is what I'm going to be doing as I'm creating the final piece. Only as I am creating the final piece, I will be activating this color with water a couple of times throughout the process. If you'd like to learn more about how I layer my colors, how I tackle developing that wide range of values all throughout the piece, and how I activate watercolor pencil pigment with water and a brush, make sure to check out some of my watercolor pencil tutorials and I explain everything step by step in those. I'll make sure to link to a couple of those down below in the text section of this post in case you'd like to go and check them out. Adding a little bit more of my medium green in this hill closest to us. All right, so that is it for my last thumbnail. I ask myself if I can take any of my colors out and limit the amount of colors in my final composition even more. I also ask myself if I want to bring in more color into the piece, in which case I consider bringing in another color. For example, if I wanted to bring in a third color for my flowers to add even more color to the piece, then I could bring in a red or reuse my purple for more flowers. And I do that right here. I, I test the idea out on this sketch. If I liked this combination of colors and how everything is looking together, then I move forward. The very last phase of my planning process involves me actually thinking of the specific techniques and the strategy or the steps that I'm going to be working through. In my Watercolor Pencil 101 video, I share all of these different techniques with you that you should definitely be aware of when it comes to using watercolor pencils. There is a specific technique in that video, for example, where I show you how to use watercolor pencils in a more painterly way and you actually use a scrap piece of watercolor paper to apply your watercolor pencil pigment and activate pigment there on your extra watercolor paper palette, if you will, and bring the pigment onto your painting using a paintbrush so the color is not applied in your final piece via a drawing tool. It's applied with a paintbrush. And that is a very helpful tool when you're trying to avoid creating pencil texture in certain areas. I really like that technique for painting skies and painting water Water, for example. That technique also allows you to fill in larger areas with a very painterly look, as if you were using traditional watercolor paint and not pencils. Whatever the case may be, I would highly recommend giving thought to what types of visual effects you want in each area of your painting and picking a technique that is going to help you arrive at those textures, those effects that you're looking for. And after you choose your specific techniques, give thought to which areas you're going to be painting when. So where are you going to start? What are you going to be moving on to next? What is going to be done at the very end? Something that I can tell you for myself whenever I am working on landscapes and scenes is I like starting with the sky and making my way forward. However, there is always a point in the process where I'm jumping around the entire piece. Give thought to how you can use different techniques to help you enhance that sense of aerial perspective as well. You don't want everything to have the same level of detail because everything is going to be competing too much. You want to always think of how you can push back things and really bring things forward that are nearest to the viewer. Another huge tip for you would be work from general towards specific. Try to fill in large areas or shapes first 
and then move on to those mark making techniques and lines that you might choose to add in for detail in certain areas or elements. Like for example, little blades of grass or even the fence. I didn't add in those things until the very end after the greens were colored in. Those types of details you usually wanna leave until the very end. Usually I start by filling in shapes and I leave mark making techniques until the very end. And something that I usually do is I actually write all of these things down that I wanna make sure to do in the final painting process. In many cases, when I'm filming tutorials and teaching classes, I actually write down an action plan for myself, a specific sequence of steps that I'm gonna be working through. Step number one, paint the sky using this technique. Step number two, paint in the large grass areas using my first two greens. Step number three, etc. And you go down like that. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to go in with a strategy. So many beginners don't do that, don't think of a strategy and specific techniques, and then they end up very underwhelmed with their results. But the fact of the matter is, great artwork doesn't happen by accident. And you may get to a point in your art journey where you've gone through the process of building up artwork from scratch so much and you have so much practice with a specific type of subject that you don't actually have to work through these steps that I shared with you today one by one. But going through these steps intentionally in the beginning is going to help train you to do all of these things intuitively later on in your journey. I'm gonna leave you a couple of full tutorials on watercolor pencil scenes down below so that you can go and check them out if you haven't already. And in those tutorials, I actually walk you through the entire process. That would come after everything that I did right now. All right, you guys, that is going to do it for today's video. I really, really hope that you enjoyed it and that you found it helpful. And if you did, pretty, pretty please make sure to give this video a thumbs up because it really helps support the work that I am doing here on YouTube and helps others get to know about my channel. Thank you so, so much for watching today. Don't forget to subscribe and click on that little bell so that you can be notified of when I share my new videos, which happens every single week. Have a beautiful rest of the day and see you soon. Bye guys.